I'm Alan Wardus, and you're listening to Think Radio. Day by day, it got better. You know, you could notice town lights started coming on. Yeah, I remember very vividly that these lights just started coming on, and <laughs> it was just like a sign of hope. I was joined this week by two students at Western State Colorado University, Ian Gonzalez and Jake Birchmore. We talked about their relief trip last fall to Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. We'll hear what they experienced and get an update on the documentary film they're producing about the trip. That and much more on this episode of Think Radio. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison's locally owned hometown newspaper, and by the Western State Colorado University Office of Academic Affairs. Think Radio is also supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can become a Think Radio patron, visit alanwardesmedia.com. That's A-L-A-N-W-A-R-T-E-S media dot com. Hian, Jake, thanks for coming by today. Yeah, great to be here. We've got a lot to talk about because this was an amazing, shocking, heartbreaking event. Um, just to remind everyone, last summer was an, an incredible year for hurricanes. I mean, we had Harvey in Texas that dumped an unprecedented amount of rain. But then, Ian, on your home island of Puerto Rico, there were not one, but two hurricanes, Irma and Maria, I, 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 I want people to be able to wrap their heads around just how devastating that really was. Um, and so I'm happy to have you here because you guys were there. Not when the storms hit, but shortly after, and you went to um, make a difference, you went to take some supplies, but you also went to just see for yourself. In the case especially of Jake, filmmaker, um, making a documentary film about that trip, but also about the situation on the ground and what people were going through. So thanks for coming by to, to fill us in. Ian, let's start with you, because I'm wondering, you're a, a graduate student in the Master of Environmental Management program here at Western. So you're a long way from home. You're <laughs> Indeed. up in the mountains, um, and you're watching the news, and you see this thing start to develop, first with Irma and then with Maria. How did that feel to you to be here knowing that that was about to happen at home? Um, yeah, first, um, thank you for, for, you know, having us here and hosting us. You know, it's a, it's a pleasure having uh, been sharing this great and amazing experience. And, um, you know, when, when, he, when here again Irma and, and here again Maria happened, uh, the very first, you know, my, my first thought, you know, was, I was like, no, it's okay because it's, we have we are a tropical island. We receive you know a good amount of water in this kind of uh, season, um, but it seems like uh, Hurricane Maria for sure uh, awakes awakes all Puerto Rican and, and all the world about the effects of these natural disasters. Because uh, for instance, Hurricane Maria has been the the most devastated and 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 impact uh, hurricane that has affect uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, in, in, in its in, history. Yeah, in decades. Yeah, in decades. Okay. Because the first one was Hurricane Hugo, um, and Hurricane Hugo was like 80 years ago, like, like that. So my mother even didn't, uh, you know, live that kind of uh, uh, scenario. So when it happens, we I was, I was like kind of like in shock. First, because uh, communication just got lost at all. Like Puerto Rico blackout, uh, no communication, no nothing. So that meant you were not able to pick up the phone and and yeah. find out. Yeah, yeah, it was what's like, going on. Yeah, it was like literally like hours before the hurricane started like hitting Puerto Rico. Like we text uh, through our family chat. We have a family chat, and I was like, you know, they were they were all prepared, you know, just waiting for it. Um, but that was like, you know, love you all, take care. And then suddenly, no communication, blackout. Um, well, and the news that was coming through was pretty scary. Yeah, and, and most of the news was think, thanks to the radio, for mm -hmm. sure. It wasn't like mm -hmm. TV or nothing. It was like AM radio, just trying to uh, at least communicate to uh, FEMA, to these uh, emergency agencies uh, that 
what's going on, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was really kind of like scared, but curious at the same time, because I was like, wow, like how, how, how we are going to react. What's our like next step? How are we? You know, it was mm -hmm. really, it was a lot of uncertainty is the word. Or mm -hmm. <clears throat> uncertainty uncertainty yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure and you know it was uh quite uh scared for sure and again i didn't have communication at least for a week yeah with for with my family <laughs> yeah well and you've lived through a hurricane yourself right um several years ago yeah i i i lived uh through hurricane george mm -hmm. it was like category two or three You know, it was kind of like a... <laughs> Which is bad enough, but these days we kind of have to say, yeah, it was just a Category 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, but it wasn't like Maria. Maria's, yeah. Maria definitely covers all Puerto Rico. And in, uh, for instance, here like in George, um, I was like, I think, eight years or seven. And it was kind of like heavy raining, big, big, uh, big winds, but, you know, not such a thing as Maria. Describe what you mean by that, that Hurricane Maria was different from from others that you've experienced and from stories that you've heard from family members. Why was this hurricane so different? Well, to put it as in a big scope, I think Hurricane Maria was an awakening. Was an awakening for the whole Puerto Rico island. Um, because first... We as Puerto Ricans knew that we were, we were not prepared for these kind of natural disasters. And as an island and in being the Caribbean, we are uh, more, um, we are in a, in, a, in a spot that we are, we are at least going to be hit by a tropical storm and here again at least one or two per year. So we need to be prepared. We need to be resilient for these uh, effects. But... Um, But you can be prepared for a Category 2 hurricane and not prepared for the kind of hurricane that Maria was and the kind of hurricane that, frankly, we're seeing more of these days. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep happening. But again, like after Maria was an awakening, like mo most, most people like this, you, you could see that after Maria, there were not this uh, separation between social classes, you know. For instance, when you you were going to get fuel for your car or your uh, electric generator, the same the same uh, the same access that a poor people you know have is the same access as a rich people can have because they need to do the line and wait and just put like five or ten dollars just hmm. to get a little bit and everybody wait. has a similar need in that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, that's We, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, they were not like difference in social classes. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to, you know, accept the reality and just start working together and no, no judgment, no separation, everyone together. So Jake, you're um, not from Puerto Rico. No, <laughs> no. How did you get involved in this project? Tell us a little bit about your background and why this particular film really mm -hmm. caught your imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm from Telluride, Colorado, which isn't too far away from Gunnison, um, but is definitely far away from Puerto Rico. Um, and so what really intrigued me about this project was Eon's spirit and happy, outgoing mentality that basically brought me in. Um, you know, how he was talking about days after the hurricane where he couldn't speak to his family that that was one of the days that he came to me um while we were in the cafeteria of western's cafeteria so he talked to me about this project of going down there personally to bring supplies start fundraising start reacting to this disaster in a way that would provide lots of benefits to the people who've been hurt and devastated and So I'm a photographer first and foremost and starting to evolve into filmmaking. And this has become a great starting point for me in my film career. And, you know, Eon and I, we communicated upon creating something that would show 
how bad this disaster was, but as well as how can this be an indicator for future resiliency and current resiliency? Yeah, and you've both used this word resiliency. I know that's something that's important to you because you're a student at Western also, Jake. Yeah. And, yeah. and what department are you in? I'm in the school of ENVS, the School of Environment and Sustainability, and as well as the MEM program. I just announced I'll be doing the three plus two option to get my master's in environmental management. And I think Eon inspired me to do that. And so when you when you look at a project like this, and you're a photographer, so you're used to thinking in terms of images, did you right away recognize that the power of film was going to be very useful to you in, in telling this story? And before you went on the trip, how did you get your head around what sort of imagery you were going to be seeing and how to how to capture it and sort of preparing to tell this story before you even went. We didn't go right away after meeting. You know, Eon and I did the fundraising and everything, and I was trying to capture that moment as well as thinking about what I could be capturing when we get there. I had no idea what it would be like. Had you had anything like that in your life to prepare you for a, a disaster? A, right. Any, yeah. any other thing that you <clears throat> no. experienced? Yeah. So, no. so so, adding adding to that, you know, before we, we started this uh mission to go to Puerto Rico, how, how me and Jake met, uh, we started like doing some recording and, and footage about the zero waste. And zero waste being project to reduce the amount of trash that yeah. goes into the landfill exactly. to nothing. Exactly. And Western's committed to that, right? In a certain period of time? What is it? About? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we, the zero waste uh, term itself, it's that when you divert uh, 75 or 80 percent of the total waste you generate in your municipality or your school. So for us to be zero waste, we need to divert at least 75 or 80 percent of our waste, and that and that's and that's mean not going to landfill or uh, incineration. Mm -hmm. So uh, possibilities, do uh, options that we have is recycling, reusing, reducing and for sure composting, that is organic waste diversion. Uh, but we started like, you know, recording this footage and to tell our community about the importance of zero waste. And me and Jake worked work along, like we went to the landfill, we do a lot of footage, we interview, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> so you didn't turn the camera on the minute you got off Puerto Rico for the first time. You'd been no. working together on yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we had been working together as, and it was going so well. And then we were halted by this disaster. We kind of forgot about our project on zero waste for the meantime. Well, as important as that yeah, is, yeah. it doesn't really compare to an right. entire island nation. Yeah. Being, but you know, it was devastated. really difficult. It was really, really difficult because we were we were both, you know, students focusing in our um, uh, studies, me doing my master, um, and I was like, how can we go to Puerto Rico and keep our pace in our studies? Mm -hmm. So what was the answer to that? How did you do it? Well, I was <laughs> only there for 10 days, and Eon was there much longer than that. Um, as an undergraduate, I'm only 20 years old, I'm a junior, and right in the middle of classes, basically, and mm -hmm. I am so grateful to have these professors that can respond to this mission mm -hmm. and project that I want to be involved in, because I find it very valuable in this day and age. And Sure, I would imagine that they um, got on board and, yeah, and their tried response, to help you figure it out. Their response was really helpful and open to this idea. Yeah. No, but for sure, for sure. I think I think the whole purpose of us being and going to Puerto Rico was the support we started receiving from the whole Gunnison community and Western community. It was like amazing. It was amazing for me, like seeing that, you know, being here from Puerto Rico, <laughs> far away, and seeing that engagement within faculty, within students, within staff, within the whole Western community, Gunnison community, it was like, wow, you know, we, we still having hope that there's a human touch, human connection. And, you know, we start doing a lot of fundraising, uh, we're doing, going to, to classroom, working with students as well. Like students itself, they start doing uh, silent auctions, students uh, driven initiatives. 
And I was like, wow, Jake, this is happening. So then we start just like moving forward and we start, we create our Facebook page, you know, Western Action Network in order for uh, not just only focus in Puerto Rico, but like telling people like we can see how this community works to help other people. So this is like a good platform to, for instance, if you're from Africa and Africa in your hometown is having a big drought and they need whatever initiative they want to do, we can just build it through this uh, platform. Hmm. So, so you guys have kind of created a model that yes. can be used for other disasters. Yes, yes. We we identify that Jake started like creating uh, another teamwork of marketing and blogging because uh, us being in Puerto Rico, how can we communicate to this community when you all want to know and, and see what's going on? So, you know, Jake came uh, with this teamwork of students. So we just like get some footage, then upload it, and they, and they, will, they will just put it in the Facebook page. And I'm trying to get some updates, uh -huh. yeah, at least I'll... one per week. <laughs> so you've decided to go, you've raised the money, You've gathered some stuff, right? I mean, mm -hmm. people donate a lot of stuff, and you bought some yeah, things. Yeah. And if I recall right, at the last minute, you're about to get on the plane, and the flight gets canceled. <laughs> what happened there? Yeah. That flight was from Atlanta to New York. Um, we had quite a journey before that as well. We drove down in a, we rented a car full of supplies donated from the Gunnison community and drove down to Austin, Texas, where we met an EMT who's also a nurse who was putting together his own initiative down in Austin. And we had connections through him from somebody who used to date him, I think, somebody from Western. <laughs> and uh, All roads lead back to Western, I mm -hmm. think. But once we got down to Austin, it was all figuring out our logistics and planning for how we're actually going to get all of our supplies down there. And that was difficult. And then having the flight get canceled, that was a whole nother story due to Hurricane Nate, another hurricane that was had devastated uh, Costa Rica and then come up through the U.S. Well, as we and, said, it was an incredible year for, yeah. for hurricanes. So the flight that you had arranged was going to take your supplies. You were going to be able to get yourselves down there as well. And it canceled because of another hurricane. Yeah, well, that flight was um, taking us personally. We were having mm. our cargo shipped on a different flight. Um, <laughs> a lot of figuring out our flight was just a whole part of the equation. But we had to drive from Atlanta to, to New York because our whole flight plan was from Austin to Atlanta to New York to Puerto Rico. And we did whatever we could possible. So we rented a car in Atlanta, drove 18 hours through the night, the three of us, and made it to New York in time, in the morning, like right at 6 a.m. for a flight that was leaving at 8.30. That's quite the road trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely was uh, really crazy and, and like kind of savage, you know, way of going all the way like switching you know and yeah we just arrived in in new york like time like breaking record like wow we just met there that was a really uh remar remarkable uh moment because at that time we met dr caroline hartridge an important name an important figure in all this process tell me why yeah so dr caroline hartridge is an uh, osteopathic Mm -hmm. and an Naduro, osteopath and naturopathic uh, doctor and she's full of energy and love and as, as soon as we just got there and meet with her and meet with the, the other paramedic um, Elizabeth Conde I felt like good energy I was like wow mm -hmm. wow 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 this is okay this is getting better and we just did a, a good hug just like first time seeing well, okay let's go to the airport now and that's how, that's where all the stories start. Yeah, and so this was our team that really was formulated through social media. And I find such great importance in this modern age with connecting people, because we had never met these people before, um, these nurses and doctor, and 
you know, Eon and I were first this team of two that grew into a team of eight and grew into a whole coalition of humans wanting to do good. All because you told the story on social media that you mm -hmm. were planning to go and you connecting with others that had similar plans. Right. Wow. Exactly. And I think it's everything happened because, you know, it needs to happen. Me and Jay were going to go by, by ourselves. Since I know most of, you know, for sure Puerto Rico, I, I, I can say I'm a leader there in Puerto Rico and know where to go and who to contact, who to work with. Um, but everything started working and, and happening organically. Mm -hmm. It's happening. Let's just go with the flow. And by this time, were you in contact with people in your family in Puerto Rico? Yeah, but that time already uh, before we, we, we went out from here in Gunnison, I think it was October the 1st or something like that. Uh, I, I already had, like, contact my mom and my family. You know, it wasn't, like, the best connection, but we talked because there were some uh, landlines, mm -hmm. landline phones that was working. So they went to a family house to have these landline phones. So they start receiving and, and doing calls. So that's how we connected. But, you know, it was really great when we just uh, fly out from from New York, uh, we arrived in Aguadilla. That was the best place to arrive because San Juan was so packed, being like kind of like the one airport. And when we arrived there was like the whole airport was like tear down. And when you received, you know, your baggage and stuff was like dark. So we just put our headlamps and it was 2 p.m. It was so dark. But anyways, the administration of Quebradilla Municipality in the northwest they they took us with uh with a trolley and they and they took us all the way to an abandoned hospital and that's how we start like growing as a team and start like delegating and we start doing search and rescue dr caroline hartrich uh started like going with us doing search and rescue but at the second week she started working more in the hospital to um bring up that abandoned hospital that today is the only first free clinic it's a free hospital clinic for the community. And and thanks to these beautiful initiatives and, you know, um, now nurses around the world, doctors go to Puerto Rico, specifically to that hospital to do some volunteer work and help our community. And was it a free hospital before the hurricane or this has happened It was an abandoned then? hospital for abandoned. 10 years. Oh, right? I see. So yeah. we had the whole structure, but it was like, yeah. honestly, it was so scary. We were there with the National Guard because the National Guard were like, this need to be connected with everything. So Puerto Rico have one one of the after Maria they have this dam and and the dam itself has has a like a fracture. Mm -hmm. In fracture. Yeah, it was that was fake. that was in the news for yeah. quite yeah. some time there. Mm -hmm. So the National Guard was in Quebradilla, that municipality. So in that abandoned hospital was staying also the National Guard. Who and were fixing the dam. Who were fixing the dam with other or with other agencies. But then the National Guard's were, uh, job was to bring up a, a filtration system using the river water. And that filtration system could uh, filtrate 15,000 gallons per hour of water. So they were doing wow. a, an amazing work. And it was like amazing works at the same time. Water <laughs> filtration and us doing this research and rescue, helping the community, assessing their needs. For instance, like fever, and by that time was the leptospirosis. Like people were just like so scared about le leptospirosis. Um, and was there electricity at this hospital? No, no, no. Or, or anywhere for that matter, right? I mean, for mm -hmm. a long time, a lot of it was power generators. Yeah, you know, if you, if you took a walk down the street in Cape Verdeas, you'd notice that some places have lights on. That's just from power generators. And as we were there, day by day, it got better. You know, you could notice town lights started coming on probably by day eight. Yeah, I remember very vividly that these lights just started coming on. And <laughs> it was just like a sign of hope. Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison, Colorado's locally owned hometown newspaper. Think Radio is also supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can join the Think Radio community of patrons, visit alanmortismedia.com. 
That's A-L-A-N-W-A-R-T-E-S media dot com. Well, so you're at this abandoned hospital. There's no electricity. You're surrounded by the people who are working on a dam that could break. Were you in the path of this dam? Had it broken, would it have put you in danger? No, no. For us, no, because it was like more... The, the, the location, it wasn't like close to us. I see. But you used the word scary. You said it was scary to be there. It was uneasy. But knowing we weren't going to be in the flood path, um, mm. that felt better. But they had to evacuate 70,000 people from downstream. I One of the days got to go... We got to go drive down to the beach where if that dam would have broken, it would have gone through like a lot of villages, Uh towns, like, and a lot of the trip, I was mainly associated with another filmmaker named Keith Hill from Telluride as well. Right. And so, yeah, that brings up the next sort of topic. Um, I'm sure the minute you hit the ground, the cameras were rolling. Yeah. And it was your job, your mission there really, um, to document to capture Mm -hmm. this story Mm -hmm. what can you share with us things that stand out in your memory in those first few days of being in in puerto rico what did you see that that made the strongest impression on you upon first arrival just in the plane sitting in there seeing the land come out because we had been flying over the ocean for a while seeing the water as well Put together with the ocean, the the mud just made these incredible textures that we noticed right away. It looked like veins. And it looked like the island had been bleeding, honestly. That's my comparison to it. Mm. And like Ian was saying, when we got off the plane and went into that baggage claim, I just, it smelled like a cave. I thought we were just like lost in a dark, dark cave. So you had to put your headlamps on to get through the building. Yeah. Yeah, and they were doing manual baggage claim, calling out our names. Um, you could just see people's, you know, tearing up. We were on a plane that only had cargo, and then other than that, we were with other families who were traveling down to help their other family members. Mm-hmm. And so, that was a big picture that is still very vivid in my head. Is just seeing those the people that are really worried and. Mm-hmm. Stressed. Well, so yeah. that's a powerful image and a powerful experience for you. Mm-hmm. You'd never been there. Ian, mm. this is your home. You land in your home and it's devastated like this. How did that feel to you? Yeah, well, it was pretty bad. In my case, I'm all about happiness. <laughs> Again, I'm all about happiness. I don't I never see like a chaos. I always see possibilities and opportunities. So when we were there, we were like just like land there and just driving all the way from the airport to this abandoned hospital and just seeing all the destruction grids of electric electricity in the floor and even dogs and, you know, just a lot of devastation. But at the same time, I was like, what are we going to do? You know, it, this is just happening, but what, what are we going to do? So... Again, this abandoned hospital was full of was and is full of magic, and we just <laughs> okay. Now you use your word like magic. You have to stop and tell me what you mean by that. Magic, a yeah. lot of energies together. You know the word fusion, mm-hmm. when when it's that like the binding energy, a lot of energy together, good energy, good willingness to help. Uh, the first two or three days we were like, you know, going here and then blah, 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 blah. But I saw something. I saw like, we need to organize. We need to start delegating to be more effective. So I just put a note in, in this uh, in this wall, just put like a 7 p.m. meeting. And people were like, what? what's going on? <laughs> so it was a meeting to know each other. Because when we were and there, that was, that was your idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need okay. to we need to know each other. We need I need to. Why are you here? What's your passion? What are you? What are you looking for? So then we start like you know co-creating the whole initiative, and that's why it's magic, and and it's it, it was amazing. So you know we've all seen movies, lots and lots of movies where a disaster strikes, and what happens is society falls apart. Everybody's out for themselves, they're attacking each other. But it, you, you're painting a very different picture, that people came together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and they would show up for a meeting not even knowing why. Mm -hmm. Was that your experience there, that when you went out into the countryside, for instance, did you find people doing that very same thing? Well, so in these rural communities, a lot of the people there hadn't seen help from outsiders like us. Um, and at, at all in, in the whole time? This was 18, 19 days after you were the when we first, first got people they to, saw. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And of course, they would see some FEMA officials, um, but they didn't see individual volunteers getting out um, until we showed up. And, and so what did you find in those communities? I mean, were these people on the very edge? They had had no electricity, no running water. Mm -hmm. Right. We visited a community that had babies and children that needed milk like right away. And they were really dehydrated. They were living in a space that had a stagnant water pool in the center of their neighborhood from buildup of flooded waters just overtaking their community and flooding their homes to the second level. Like this was a lot of water. And we got to go into people's homes and see this for ourselves. We got to see how much the water was affecting by creating so much mold and how unhealthy their living space was, was unimaginable for someone like us to experience. Okay, come on, Jake, you're from Telluride, yeah. right? That's about as far from your life experience as you can get. Yeah. What did that make you feel? It made me feel like I had taken for granted all the things that I had been given in my life. And it made me really trace back what, how grateful I am to be in the spot I am, mm. being from Telluride, going to school, getting my college education, and just wanting those people to have the same. In a village like that, in a situation like that, people really on the edge, can you think of a, of a story that you'd want to share about um, someone that you met that really made a powerful impression on you? So this abandoned hospital was huge for people. Some of the people we had talked to, Keith and I, um, they had said, if it wasn't for this hospital, I would probably be dead. And that was one of the things that really struck us as far as what is this story about? You know, there's all these people wanting to do good. And so that fusion of energy and those people coming together, I think the abandoned hospital turning to free clinic is the core of this story. It's so important and crucial for so many people out there who really needed attention and what weren't getting it. So many of the hospitals did not have electricity, did not have the personnel. I mean, the ones that were existing had the personnel, but they were trying to function in a way they'd never had before. And this new opportunity to restore this hospital was just powerful and well, that's amazing a, for these people. That's extremely exciting, and it brings up a point that we might as well talk about now, and that is, okay, the hospital came into being. This abandoned hospital sort of was a magnet for the people who were wanting to do good. Jan uh, holds a meeting <laughs> at 7 p.m. and says, hey, let's get to know each other. Let's work together, and it worked. But now months have gone by, and this thing has to be sustained, what needs to be done to sustain the work that you saw begin in those first few weeks? So you remember the name I told you? Yeah, tell us again. Dr. Caroline Hartridge. Okay. The wonderful, the, the love, the passion, the happiness. Um, so that has been her, kind of her project to sustain that hospital. Because to operate, we, we were operating under uh, emergency, uh, you know, alert. So everything was like, you know, there's no regulations or rule. You know, we're trying to address situation, just, we do it. Just get it done. Right. So after that, now it's like the question you do, like how how these services are going to be sustained, how we're going to keep working together. So Dr. Caroline Hartridge started like putting her magic and knowledge into this hospital, organizing, creating the, tri the triage area, the patient's room, you know, cleaning everything. And again, I think all this magic... Uh, 
inspire the, the, the whole municipality and the whole administration to see like, wow, these people are doing so great to our, our community. Let's keep helping them. So the municipality create like a nonprofit, like a private public nonprofit kind of, so they can, you know, receive donations through the municipality and the municipality will address all of this to the hospital. So we start like receiving a lot of resources, like medical uh, supplies and water and thing. And um, right now it's, you know, it's, it's great. It's great. And it's going to be shown in a, in a film again that uh, Jake and Keith, Keith have, has been putting. And you will see that kind of transformation and transition. No, oh, I can't Where, wait to see that. Yeah, yeah. You can see from the darkness to the light. Because <laughs> there were there were no no lights and and it was like the floor was all like kind of flooded. Now it did, now the floor has tiles. Um, it's amazing, man. It's amazing. And the whole yeah. Puerto Rico people they're so humble and you know. For instance, if you if you're gonna help me, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my food. Like hey, you you want some coffee? You want some bread? Are we were in Ponce in the in the south? where there was another community that they didn't have water and the nothing and we just were there just providing the water filters and trying to collect water from the river or whatever and they just receive us with bread cheese and coffee and i was like no 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 take this if i don't take it that will be you know disrespectful because uh -huh. you know uh -huh. they are giving their resources to you as a helper so it's you know. it's hard really when you talk about a disaster like this to use the words silver lining. I mean, you never, <laughs> ever, ever want to go through something like this. But if what is developing in the aftermath of Maria is a better way of doing community resiliency. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure it will be. So tell me how. I mean, today. How is it better today, even as they rebuild, even as they still struggle in some places with electricity and water and so forth? How is it better? What has improved for them? I think the community part, the human capital, the human, the social, the natural capital ha have been getting more value of the people. You know, knowing that without that kind of capital, the social, the human and natural capital, we can operate even if we have a great financial capital. You mm. know, because Puerto Rico has been well known because of corruption, for sure. A lot of people know that Puerto Rico is in debt, but when you start getting and, and knowing all this debt, it's because of maladministration, you know. So after this, most of the uh, mayors, uh, they have been knowing the need of the people, trying to address those needs, trying to work more with the community, putting their boots on and going into the, you know, land and trying to work more with uh, land development in terms of agriculture, local. Let's invest in our local economy, you know. Because, for instance, uh, when, when the Hurricane Maria happened, I don't know if you know about the Jones Act. I don't. Mm -hmm. So the Jones Act is this act uh, that the U.S. government uh, have with Puerto Rico, as Puerto Rico being a U.S. territory but not incorporated, um, that everything that is going to be delivered to Puerto Rico, entering to Puerto Rico, from, let's say that um, Mexico want to send three ships of full of supply, they can go straight to Puerto Rico. They need to go to a, a U.S. port, mainly in Florida, get all this cargo, put it in a, in a U.S. cargo made by U.S. materials, and then transport it all the way to Puerto Rico. So that's that what that, that's harder than it has to be. Yeah. Yeah, that that was another thing that after Hurricane Maria we struggled we struggled a lot in supplies because of that law. Even uh the 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 government and the people were saying to the US president to just like, you know, stop that law for this just stop it. And I don't know what's the word to use. Suspend it, maybe. Suspend it. Suspend mm -hmm. that law and the US president said no we will we cannot suspend that because the ship owners will not be happy mm -hmm. <laughs> well and then yeah mm. but uh, after that three or four days after that they he suspended and that's why i started getting more and more supplies to puerto rico mm -hmm. well this picture you paint of um grassroots change in the villages 
people being more aware of each other's needs, more willing to, hmm. to, yeah. to set aside old ways of doing things and, and try something new, like, you know, actually helping each other yeah. out. Wow, that sounds to me like something that we could all learn and not have to wait for a, a natural disaster to come along. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, uh, the, every community in, in the world, every community in America has issues that could profit from that exact same Unfortunately, mindset. Yeah. yeah. But I think I think I think here in this beautiful valley of Gunnison there's a great community. There's a great community. I got a lot of willingness to work together and know that, you know, we are kind of like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and this I think this is a good example and, and, and I'm and I'm grateful also to be here because I think being here opened my eye and, and, and vision and went to Puerto Rico and started like maybe integrating things that I learned with by being here to be more connected to our people. So do you have plans to return to Puerto Rico when you're done with your uh, Really soon, education? probably next month. Okay. Yeah, because like when you were uh, talking about the grassroots movements and stuff, that opened the new chapter. And the new chapter is that I'm working uh, to open a, like a collaboration center, kind of like an ice lab, because we knew, we, we, we saw the need of having a place for nonprofit, for organization, for individuals to get together, to create, to develop, to bring positive outcomes. They were like, you know, maybe let's, oh, let's, let's, let's going to have a meeting in this fast food. Let's going to have a meeting here. So it was kind of difficult to get the people together and empower them and maybe give, provide them the tools to create uh, successful projects. Uh-huh. And, and this new collaboration center, the name that it's going to have is Fusion, Fusion. <laughs> because his energy it. is getting together. I love it. That and word it, has come to, the, to yeah, the top, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, and I want to make sure people understand, you mentioned the Ice Lab. That's actually where we're sitting right now recording this broadcast. Um, ICE here in, at, on the campus of Western stands for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. And it's a center devoted to that same kind of thing. Not with the same stakes, perhaps. We're mm-hmm. not rebuilding a country here, but we're... You know, we're working on economic development and, and bringing communities together and so forth. So I love the fact that, yeah, you, that, yeah. that you're going there and, and creating something that's very similar. Exactly. And, and our purpose is, you know, you talk about economic development, but in order to get economic development, you need to, again, work with the three capitals, natural, human, and social capital. Right. Natural, mm-hmm. human, and social capital. When you work for those three, by default, financial capital will just come up increase (laughs) because you will get the people happy you will get all you will get a balance and then you will be implementing sustainable development Mm. (laughs) so jake do you have plans to go back i mean i would think for your film i want to thank him for sure to puerto rico (laughs) yeah for your film it'd be very interesting to go back and see the contrast i would think yeah and that's the thing we keith has already gone back and keith is your partner yes keith hill he's a freelance filmmaker and um, we grew up together and he's really the brains behind this whole story, this script. He's writing the script. I'm really trying to help him as much as I possibly can through going to school and with editing the post-process. And he's been there. He went down for a, a week. I don't know how long after. Um, he's been back again since he went the first time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. La- last time I went there, he went like kind of the same time. And we went there with Keith as well. But Jake, maybe you can also tell to these listeners about the human, the smiling human. Right. So we created a the smiling humans. That's Keith. Keith and I blended that together when we started as a, as the team of filmmakers, just trying to do good and doing the best we could as far as like help. How can we be? helpful factors in this. Is that a company or an organization or what? The Smiling Humans. The Smiling Humans, we're a company. Mm-hmm. We're um, not towards profit, but towards our film and who's producing this film is The Smiling Humans. And um, we're ultimately a collective of creators passionate about deploying modern filmmaking and photography to disaster-ridden areas. Because mm-hmm. um, <laughs> all we could do, really, is document and help when we could you know i was trying to put some tarps on some roofs um, as much as i could away from the camera but keith and i were behind the lens most of the time Um, and then upon getting back 
we're just trying to create this story and really show the people. Well, I, I want to stop you right there because I don't want you to, to uh, mislead people mm. that being behind the lens is somehow less powerful right. <laughs> because that's how people like me really get to see what, what it was that you experienced and what's going on. I mean, I couldn't hmm. go, but I'm going to watch your film and it'll um, be more meaningful to me as a result. So don't, uh, yeah. don't discount the power mm -hmm. of, of what you mm -hmm. do. When can we see the film? When is it projected yeah. to be finished? We're trying to enter it into the Telluride Mountain Film Festival. That's a film festival that Keith and I have been watching and going to ever since we could walk, really. Sure, you know, the Hometown Festival. Yeah, the Hometown Festival. It's Most of you should know about it if you're around from around the county, and um, that is on in May 20th. Okay. So, you know, we're working with the people there to implement this film into their showings um and hopefully we'll make the deadline that they have but i think they'll be working with us through the process knowing how important this story would be for their theme this year which is migration um, oh well, i would think so so and and after that uh, are we going to be able to see it here locally anytime soon yeah we're trying to get it done as soon as we can um and their deadline is february 5th and we're trying to set up an, an event here on campus at the University Center Theater to show it, have a screening and discussion. Outstanding. And that's probably where it will be shown first. Well, February 5th, what are you doing sitting here talking to me? You need to be finishing the movie. Yeah. That's what I have Keith for. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keith. Keith. So we're wrapping up, but I want to ask you this. How do people get involved now? Because the hurricane's over, the initial aftermath is over, but there's a long process of rebuilding and strengthening yeah. this this community. How do we do that? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. And so, for instance, like we are working on maybe by the second week or third week of February, show this uh, screening and and what's the name? Screening and discussion. <laughs> that that screening of discussion, so people can get more engaged and involved. And we have two students and, and here at Western that before Hurricane Maria, they were a, a, a transfer student uh, studying in Puerto Rico. Oh. So they were so connected as well. So they wanted now to help pets and animal rescue. That is a big need right now in Puerto Rico. So we're trying to uh, merge that initiative with the screening and discussion uh, day, you know, so people can get more involved and we're trying to, you know, develop how they can get more involved. But for instance, as well, I have a nonprofit in Puerto Rico who, who the one who's doing the, the Fusion uh, Collaboration Center, um, and it's open for anyone who wants to do research uh, whatever in social, environmental, in economy, we can, we they they can go to Puerto Rico and they can have a place to stay and they can learn about this culture. If they want to get involved and go there and help rebuilding, we have places to do it. It's just to contact us through our webpage, maybe Western Action Network or Haha, uh, our nonprofit Youth Together for the Environment in Arecibo. And there's a lot of ways to get involved for sure okay well what i'm going to do is post all that information on my website so when people come to uh hear the podcast then um the, it'll be there for them to see yeah and smilinghumanscollective.com is the website of keith and i okay. doing the work for the film we have updates showing our videos we have short video clips that we've kind of been trying to get out there um before a feature film and then we also have our photography and blog posts from students who have been involved with this as well. I had a service project that brought together ENVS 100 students from Western who did some writing for us and did some research for the general public to really go in there and read. So I hope you can visit smilinghumanscollective.com. We'll do it. And I'll post that on the website as well. Yeah. And I would just like to share uh, that... We need to live the present. We need to live the now. And the now is all about love and happiness, you know. And if we are all in love and sharing happiness, we can build a better present for a better future, you know. And we need to promote and, and just keep this message out there because we need to strength this happiness and love mm -hmm. for sure. Even in the middle of something like Hurricane Maria. Yeah. Fellas, thanks for joining me. It's been awesome. 
Thank you. Thank you for having us. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison, Colorado's locally owned hometown newspaper. Think Radio is a production of Alan Wardus Media. The show's executive producer is Issa Forrest. Associate producer, Kat Seibert. Original music by Issa Forrest. New episodes are available for download every Monday morning on iTunes and at alanwardusmedia.com. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Think Radio.